And a very good evening, everyone. Welcome into your box seat. Brought to you in association with Sweet Lou and, of course, that other side better's delight. Amongst others, they have at Woodlands. Hope your harness racing week has gone well. We've got a whole lot on the show for you tonight. A review of the Road Cup Carnival, a preview of the first night of Addington's two very big premiers, and, of course, we'll talk about blood spinning, something that uh, I've been out and about and learnt a whole lot more uh, in the last couple of days. Joining us as per the norm is uh, Michael Guerin. Evening to you, Michael. Uh, a busy show ahead, but a terrific time in harness racing it is. Sure is, Gregory. A big hi to you, big hi to everybody around the country. Thanks for joining us. Hope Wednesday was good to you. Looking forward to your yarn, Gregory, on the blood spinning. It's something I've heard about, but I don't know the specifics of it. And it's great you've been able to get the official word on it and also some vets to talk about it. So interested to see what it's all about. But as a harness racing time of the year, outside Cup Week in Christchurch, Greg, I think this is almost the best time of the year because we don't have a lot of major gallops races. We don't have a lot of major sporting events in the country at the moment, Greg. We have a really strong carnival to review from Alexandra Park, um, a big carnival coming up at Addington, then all leading into the jewels, Greg. So I think it's a time when harness racing really is right at the forefront of the punters' minds and at the forefront of my mind, Greg, driving home from the races on Friday. Friday night was, did we see both the pacer of the year and the trotter of the year winning at Alexandra Park last Friday? Yeah, quite possibly, Michael. So let's have a look at what you've got ahead on your show tonight. And we start off uh, by having a look at the Reharvest Row Cup and uh, the Dun Double. Yes, the Anzac Cup into the Row Cup. Uh, a very small number have achieved that. Uh, we'll have a look at the horse that ran second as well, Speeding Spur, and what a terrific career he's had uh, over four or five seasons now. Unreal from him. We've got a whole lot of other Group 1s too. Uh, and Hansia Kahn's one of those, and he did get back down trotting and did a great job to win. We'll have an update on the jewels, including the configuration of the front row uh, to uh, change a little bit for the jewels itself. We'll talk about that blood spinning. And yes, Michael Guerin will get out with his scissors and uh, cut a lawn. Right, let's get straight into it. It was the 101st running of the Rehar Harvest uh, Row Cup. There was a few things happening in this event, but ultimately the horse in the yellow colours in front right now did exactly what he did a week ago. Working home strongly was Le Monde and out wider then to uh, Habibi Inter in front though. Sunday Sun, Sunday Sun, the rising of Sunday Sun, the Anzac Cup winner and he goes back to back in the Row Cup. Second over Speeding Spur, a gallant defence of his title. Good luck in the US too. Down the outside Majestic Man's rocketed home for third. Congratulations, John. Back-to-back -back Group 1s at the park for this horse. Uh, what a remarkable rise it's been. Yeah, it definitely has, Greg. Like, uh, every time we, we put him in a big race, it's on three old, he let us down. So he's, uh, he's repaid us big time now. This is your second big Group 1 trotting win in a week. Is this the biggest win of your career? You've won plenty of Group 1s here, Venus Serena and the like, but this must rate right up there. Yeah, definitely, like you say, like um, Road Cup, it's like New Zealand Cup, the trotters, so uh, I got beat so narrowly in the New Zealand Cup, so this would have been the best win of my life. Tell me about the run and when you decided to move, was that pre-planned, was that something you'd thought about going into the race? Not really, just sort of, I, uh, I settled a lot, lot handier than I did, like I was full back the outer, which I thought I'd be just a couple of gallopers up front early, sort of, um, mean, I, mean I could settle that close, so... They sort of backed off the speed a wee bit and, and the horse, he can stay in sprint, so um, it was sort of a wee bit of a plan. Massive moment for you and your dad and for the hares who bred this horse as well. You must be delighted for them. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, dad deserves it a lot. Like, like I say, last week was his first group one winner as a trotter, so um, today will be a massive thing. And, and for Colin and Nancy here, like, like I said last week, breeding and breeding trotters has been his whole life, so uh, massive for him. Congratulations, mate. Well done. Thanks for that, Greg. 166,000 in the bank this season alone, Michael Guerin. Seven from 12, and potentially, with the jewels still to come, we might have just seen the trotter of the year. It's hard to make a case against him, Greg. I mean, winning those two big group ones and jewels to come, but also we haven't had it. many other horses win too. Only Speeding Spur has achieved that, and he's outpointed him there in saying that Speeding Spur will get points for finishing second. I would suggest Speeding Spur will probably win Aged Trotter of the Year, but this horse now the favourite for Trotter of the Year. Most importantly, Greg, had a conversation with Robert Dunn just a few days ago, and 
This horse isn't on the unruly for the duel, so I'm, I think a lot of us thought he probably was, but he actually just drew the outside of the second line of the Anzac Cup. So he's going to go back in the draw, Greg, and that makes him a far better chance of beating a Winterfell or a Majestic Man or a King's Landing. Am I surprised by the source? 100% I am. I, I didn't see this coming maybe ever in his career, but definitely not as a four-year-old, Greg. He's a horse I just couldn't get my head around for a lot of his career with the ups and downs, and particularly the galloping in the home straights under pressure. As we saw in that video footage, he galloped very shortly after the line, but Robert was of the opinion, Greg, that was him sort of letting down. I get to the finishing post and I, I let down and start to relax and I gallop. So I just think he's a better horse than we thought he was, Greg. And I think we all knew the talent was there, but whether the application was there was what I questioned, Greg. No more questions over him. Remarkable stat. Uh, Robert told me that he was informed by Colin here, the owner. Sunday Sun, Greg, opened $61 in the market for the Dominion. Uh, he won't be that anymore. Uh, certainly not, uh, Michael. So we need to go back and have a look at the start. And as John quite rightly pointed out, uh, he ended up a lot closer than where he expected to be. But the most remarkable thing about the Road Cup, I think in the first mile, Michael, there might have been six leaders, which you just never see at this level. Look, you don't, and I think it's indicative of how even this crop is. There, there was also quite a few horses in the race who either galloped or underperformed, as we're seeing one of them Forget the price tag having a gallop there. Destiny Jones galloped early and was excellent afterwards. Temporale had a gallop. Um, there was a lot of horses, Greg, who I think at the end of a long season are starting to underperform. So let's not take away from the winner. He was absolutely outstanding. As was Majestic Man in third for a four-year-old. And Look, Greg, this won't be a popular opinion, but I genuinely believe the Road Cup has become our best trotting race because... As we get to the final 400 here, we don't get to see the four-year-olds who have become a really big factor in open class trotting in the Dominion very often. And that's understandable. It's incredibly early in the season for them. But Greg, in four or three of the last four row cups have been won by four-year-olds, Temporale, Mon Bay, and now this horse. So while the Dominion's worth a lot more money and it has more historical influence, I presume, or maybe even prestige. Well, I think, Greg, with the way the season stacks up, the Row Cup is every bit the race the Dominion is, and to be perfectly honest, with the four-year-olds, maybe even the better race this day, these days. Well, you certainly couldn't argue with this year anyway, or this season, because that was a deep, deep race on Friday night. I just wanted to highlight their massive Metro galloping and Mark Cooler uh, banging straight into him, basically, and getting held up. He made up a lot of ground, Mark Cooler. I did speak to Clint Ford uh, this morning about uh, what he was doing with him. He said, look, he's come home. I believe he's only just come right now, was what he said to me. Um, the Australian track uh, trip really knocked him. Uh, he is turning him out though, he's giving him a really nice six week break and he'll bring him back, he's sort of thinking the Banks Peninsula Cup and then the traditional build up towards the defence of his dominion, so disappointing for him, um, more about uh, the beaten drivers though and the connections, let's hear what they had to say The word proud just comes straight to mind doesn't it? Yeah, he's unbelievable, it was a great run tonight and uh, the youth come through uh, Johnny's horse, he's a phenomenal trotter and all, all credit to him, you know, old oh, Delboy tried hard tonight. Look, it was a bit deja vu from last year. You handed up with a lap to go, two or four year old, Enhorn, I think it was last year, and you're probably hoping the same scenario, but yeah, just those younger legs. Yeah, for sure. It, it sort of panned out that way, and um, I, was, I was getting a good run in front, and I, I thought pre race, if I did find the front, um, I really admired that horse, and, and if I could follow it, that'd be great. And, it worked out, but you know, on the night, Sunny Sun was, um, you know, he was superior and uh, he was game, and he beat the rest, you know, quite easily. He certainly did. He's given you so many great thrills, so many great memories, and tonight will be another one because he showed his tenacity once again. Yeah, it's unreal like, ha how hard the horse tries. Um, yeah, it's he, he's had such a great career and, and done a lot for me and Dad. Yeah, and I reckon he'll teach you a lot as well. Like your dad taught you a lot to boot, but this horse would have taught you a lot too. Well he has really, um, I've driven nice trotters before but nothing to the extent of you know a good trotter like that, um, I've made mistakes on him before and got away with it because he's so good, you know, um, 
yeah, it's it's going to be a, quite a big learning curve for us all. But uh, yeah. It's been massive to have him around. Thanks so much for so many thrills. And um, we'll look forward to seeing what he can do stateside because he won't let them down either. No, he won't. He'll go over there and give them a good shot. Yep. Brad, he's gone great again. Yeah, super run tonight. Uh, Greg, he's just in the zone at the moment, so uh, we're really excited about the jewels. Talk me through the run. You've handed over to Mark Cooler, but, gee, there were some lead changes, and it just it couldn't have worked out worse. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Greg, Mark Cooler uh, sort of uh, inclined to me that he's intended to stay in front, but that wasn't the way that it eventuated, and uh, I probably actually had the opportunity if I wanted to come out and have, an, have a bit of a look at speeding Spur, but... Um, but just that man was over racing that hard. I thought he probably would have run a 27 quarter had I pulled him out at that stage. So um, opted for luck and he's run home brilliantly. Ross, another very good performance from him. You know, very happy, Greg. Um, just ended up parked pretty much the whole way. So just a bit of a shame, but he's stuck on pretty good. So pretty happy. He hasn't had a whole lot of luck in the 3200 metre features, has he? No, D Dominion he sat parked for a good majority of it as well. So yeah, it's just the way it's ended up. But... Uh, you can't take it away from the winner. He's, he was just too good for everybody. So, In saying that, your guys still only young in terms of trotting and therefore next season there's a lot ahead of them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the end of Dominions here at Auckland will really be right up his alley. So, and being a love you, they, with a bit of age, doesn't, doesn't hurt them at all. So be good. Yeah, I think it was uh, a great addition of the Row Carp and, and really looking forward to the trotting features in the new season, Michael, because the development of those uh, four-year-olds going forward and, and still plenty of speed in horses like Le Mans means we're in for another great season. Thank God, Greg, we've got the Inter-Dominion Trotting Series back. How flat would it be having the Inter-Dominion Pacing Series at Auckland, which is going to be great, by the way, and we'll get to that shortly, without all these good horses? Like we have so much promise in Sunday Sun and even in Hearts Your Calm, who we'll see later, um, obviously Majestic Man, and all those other horses who are still very good horses, Massive Metro and Le Monde and Marcoula. Hard to believe, Greg, we didn't have an Inter-Dominion trotting series a year ago. And it's back now, and I'm looking forward to that with every bit as much anticipation and probably more confusion than I am the pacing series, Greg. And that's not even talking about Tornado Valley coming back across and all the potential Australian Raiders. So um, that's something Harness Racing has got very right, the return of the trotting into Dominions, and that's going to make that Auckland carnival, which would have been big, Greg, huge. Yeah, definitely, Michael. Let's move on from uh, that trotting feature to what is uh, the Dolphin Half-Footed Partners uh, New Zealand Messenger. Uh, it was a small field, but it was a little bit like deja vu of the Taylor Mile the previous week. Let's get Aaron White to bring Spankham home again. Turn it up, Mark Shard and Chase Auckland. Spankham at the 100, though, in the Dawson half of New Zealand Messenger Championship. Turn it up, he'll get close, but uh, Spankham too good. Spankham and uh, Natalie Rasmussen does go back to back in the messenger. Second over, turn it up. They were following His eighth back. win from uh, the 15 starts this season, Michael, and up over 860,000. Terrific performance from him. Equally as good, I thought, turn it up. I agree. Um, Greg, probably the horse of the year for what we're seeing on that's going to be decided by barrier draws. Had you been turn it up? in the inside barrier, inside of Spankham for both those races. I think he would have won both those races. He might not have won the Taylor Mile because Spankham might have more gate speed, but we'll never know. I think he's been as good as Spankham in both races, but Spankham's come back from this time last year, Greg, being completely forgotten by us, not by the owners, not by the trainers, but by everybody else, because he'd been usurped by Chase Auckland and a whole bunch of other three-year-olds. Um, he only won the one race as a three-year-old. To come back with the Miracle Mile, Kaikoura Cup, two into Dominion Heats, and, of course, those two Group 1s, Greg, impossible for me to vote against him as Horse of the Year, and really hard to say, Greg, that he shouldn't be the favourite for the Inter Dominion, because you know, if he does draw to lead, we know his record. He's been basically unbeatable in front. Here's the start of the race, and Greg, I thought this was the really interesting part. I thought there might be gate speed from one, two, or four, but once he just rolled to the front like this, Greg, and there was absolutely no pressure, um, he was going to win. As simple as that, it became basically a mile race. Now, he was not attacked, but at least looked at by Chase Auckland in the middle stages, but I mean, Tony Hurley he obviously knew the lead wasn't going to be there after about 50 metres of that attack, Greg, and that left us at the back end of the race like this. 
He's very good. I've seen nothing to suggest, Greg, he's better than Turn It Up. And I think they're going to have some awesome battles, hopefully, over the next 18 months or so. I think they definitely will, Michael. They've already had a couple in the last uh, week, haven't they? Uh, let's hear from uh, those just placed in behind Spankham. Well, Mark, that was always going to be hard to run Spankham down. He's, he's terrific when he's in front, isn't he? He is, Greg, yeah. We went close, but, you know, he's hard to get past and uh, prove that again. Tell us about going forward. Is this guy definitely going to the jewels? Uh, yeah, at this stage, Greg, there's no reason why he won't go. He's had a relatively easy season as far as number of starts goes, and, yeah, providing he comes through and pulls up well, he'll be there. What about Chase Auckland? He's finished fourth tonight. He's in a power of pain to earn enough money, isn't he? He is. He's, he's well down the ladder and probably it's an ideal time now to say, rather than have the pressure on us to try and make it up, uh, you know, make the stake money up, uh, it'd be better to probably have a break. Well, Barry Markshard, he came up with Barrier 1 again and it was deja vu, but he's gone great. Yeah, he has, Greg. Look, oh, I'm proud of him. You know, we, uh, you know, we started the season, he only had nine starts and, and look, he's, he's done a great job all year. So, uh, yeah, it's... Uh, it's Hopefully spells well for the future. Yeah. And the same with on the cards. He's come a long way, hasn't he? Yeah, he has. He's the same, really. And, um, yeah, he might have just come to the end of it now. But, but look, they've both done a great job, really. And there's plenty to look forward to. You've got the Inter-Dominions on your back doorstep uh, later in the year, of course. So these two unlikely to go to the jewels? Yeah, they are unlikely, uh, Greg, at this stage. Max Shard definitely won't. And uh, we'll just have a talk with the owner about uh, on the cards. And that has been confirmed, Michael Guerin. Uh, when you look at uh, Mark Shard in the last couple of weeks, um, he's actually earned close to 80000 for this season. So it just shows you that, um, you know, if you can place in those Group 1s uh, as he has been able to and have a good season uh, on top of that, um, there's still good, some good money to be earned. Well, there is. There's no point shying away from the Spankums of the world because they're still going to be there next season more than likely or the season after, Greg. So you've got to race them sometime. And, and when they win that sort of money, it's easier to hold on to them. I mean, they're probably worth $200,000, these horses, to sell. But if you can win 80 and get the enjoyment out of it, Greg, and then into Dominions being on everybody's back doorstep makes it a lot easier to retain those horses, not to mention the $25,000 sort of weekly stake at Alexandra Park they can race for. So um, I'm really glad that there's this debt coming through on the cards, Max Shard, a lot of horses in that race like Henry Hubert, who, Greg, are going to be open class factors because we needed that new blood. Um, Interesting the market reshuffle after this race. It was it went in patches. So turn it up was two dollars sixty when that race started. And then Natalie said to you on the track in her post-race interview, Spankham's probably done for the season. The market closed and it reopened after Spankham had come out. And turn it up was still two dollars sixty Greg. I, I found that very perplexing. Um, how it could be two sixty with Spankham in the market. Spankham was gone, and he was still 260. The bookies have given you a real chance there, punters, when that market reopened on Monday. Now, subsequent to that, Chase Auckland's come out, but he was only 50-50th making it there, Greg, and now we're left with no Mark Shard as well. So all of a sudden, Ashley Lokaz has become the second selection. I still think the Dunn horses have a huge role to play. Henry Hubert and Ulta Maestro, Greg, but... Look, more and more, if Turn It Up gets there in one piece, and it's still three weeks to go, that $2.60 the bookies were giving you right up to start time before the messenger, Greg, um, looks incredibly good value. Yeah, it does, uh, into a dollar fifty-five now. See, on the cards are still in the market there. Um, I'm pretty sure he said he wasn't coming, but anyway, uh, he's sixteen dollars, and incidentally, he has won seventy thousand in his four-year-old uh, year as well. So again, uh, a horse that's done a terrific job. So there's an update of that market, but turn it up. Clearly, uh, the hot favourite for that now, a dollar fifty-five. Another hot favourite on the night came from the All Stars. Uh, this was in the Northern Trotting Derby. We'll go back and have a look at what happened to him earlier shortly, but the Brecon Farms Northern Trotting Derby of 2019 at this stage became a one-act affair. 
Hanshaw Calm at the 100 metres leads by two. Resonate down the outside then to Lotta Marcel and Gill Favour and Hanshaw Calm will favour it back as Jürgen Hanshaw Calm tonight after the early mistake. He wanted to throw it away again. He didn't lose as much. Yeah, so he was dominant in the end, but uh, as we saw at the start, in the same scenario in the size the previous week, uh, this time in the back straight, Michael, he just rolls into a gallop. Not only did he do that, but the second favourite and Derby winner from Addington did exactly the same. Well, and after that, Greg, after the gallop, Enhance Your Calm was excellent and a lot of muscle was terrible. Now, not terrible for a normal horse, but terrible for a horse who had done what he had done in his previous couple of starts. He's a speed horse. He pulled out of the 1-1 and couldn't run past a rival. So, as surprising as the winner's performance was, home in 56 and change, and as dominant as he was, um, I think a lot of muscles really underperformed, and that raises a question mark about him uh, for the Guineas this week. Paul Nian's a great trainer. Do I think he'll turn him around? Maybe. And Hartshaw Calm, Greg, look, clearly he's the best of the sponge. There's no doubts about that. There's obviously a mental or physical niggle somewhere, whether that was right-handed based or... I don't know. It's hard to work out what it is, Greg. He's in the right barn to get it worked out. Um, spoke to Mark Purden, definitely heading forward to the duels. But there's enough there, Greg, and that doubt over his two gallops and the fact he was beaten in the derby. For people to look at Oscar Bonavina, who resumes on Friday night, Greg, at Addington, and go, would the best Oscar beat in Hearts your car? Maybe. And interestingly, Alpha Male, who's going to be the Australian invite to this division, Greg, is missing from the New South Wales Trotting Derby on Saturday night. Spoke to Chris Alford this morning. He said, nope, I'm booked to go, and we're still indicating that I'm going to go. Now, if Alpha Male doesn't come, and he's a pretty good horse, then a horse called All Cashed Up, who was enormous at Melton last Saturday, could come. So either way, Greg, there's going to be a couple of horses who might be able to exploit and enhance your calm's manners if, and it's only an if, they rear their head again on June the 1st at Addington. Yeah, and certainly being back left-handed and at a track that he's clearly already performed on, uh, I think that'll help him. But there was a maiden who was runner-up in it, and uh, the, the driver of that horse was amongst the beaten brigade. A maiden with a Group 1 placing, that's an outstanding effort. Yeah, sure is, Greg. Uh, he backed up his great run last week after missing away, and and uh, like you say, a few galloped early, took advantage of it, but uh, good effort being a maiden. Yep. For sure, that jumps him well up the order in terms of the harness jewels, but it's not just about that, he's got a bright future. Yeah, he has, he's great staying, I suppose. He comes from the mother, good old tough liberal die mare, so um, he has got a bright future. Paul, a very good staying performance from Gil Favour. Yes, yeah, he went very well. I, I gave him a pretty hard run, and um, with the horse's credit, he kept kicking. The horse that was directly behind you was, of course, a lot of muscle. And on the face of it, Paul, I, I can tell by your reaction that you were slightly disappointed. Uh, yes, look, he's normally a high-speed horse that can come off something's back and, and sprint really well, but um, obviously he's just not, not in his, quite at his best today. Yep. Well, both of them now will head to Addington Raceway for the jewels. Will there be any races in between that time? Um... I did. I think there's a race up here for Gil Favour next week. I might just stay for. Yeah. Um, I don't. I, I, probably a lot of muscle. I'll, I'll just um, probably back off a little bit now. Let him freshen up, and probably yeah, Jules is the main aim. Pretty good campaign for both of them up here, though. Uh, yes. Yes. No. They, they've done really well for you know two young horses, a big trip away, and um, you know stand them in good stead for the future. And yeah, they'll both take their place, as you mentioned, Michael, this week. Uh, Resonate with its second placing there is now 12th in the Harness Jewels Reckoning, so a big jump up the list uh, from it. But, yep, both pools going this week, so he must be happy enough with them. Maybe, Greg, it's a case with Gil Favour, obviously he'd be happy with. Maybe with a lot of muscle he wants to get his confidence back or he's found something wrong with him. I'll, I'll try and ring Paul and get a story out there for people to indicate what the situation is there. Spoke to Robert Dunn about Resonate, the 50-50 on the jewels. And, Greg, unless you're going to win it, let's be completely honest, you can stay at Alexandra Park. He'd win a maiden in a heartbeat and then he can race in a... 55 grade race and probably go close to winning that for 20 grand. He can win as much money, Greg, staying here as he can running second in the jewels. And there's no guarantee he's going to run second in the jewels. If, I was, if he's my horse, I'd leave him at home. Leave him in Auckland. The stakes are so good, you don't need to go there. And what's a pretty strong division. So, look, Greg and Hartshaw comes the best of them, but 
Yeah, I, I still think he's six months, maybe a year away from really maturing into that big frame, which often is the case with those really big, um, tall, young trotters. All right, the last of our features uh, from the park was, of course, at Group 1 level, and it was the size stakes for the two-year-old fillies avenging her defeat the previous week. was the horse in the harness jewels and leader's colours, her name Sweet On Me. Tiffany Rose on the outside, a long view lady further back in the field then to Little Miss Perfect, Sweet On Me at the 100 metres Amazing Dream comes strongly, Sweet On Me Amazing Dream, Sweet On Me she's back in winning business tonight Sweet On Me too good over Amazing Dream, Tiffany Rose and Little Miss Perfect. Yeah she made it 5 uh, from uh, 6 and uh, avenged her, her defeat of Amazing Dream the previous week, once she found the marker pegs, once the barrier draw came out Michael, it was effectively her race to lose it was, Greg. Uh, she's obviously incredibly high class, and mm. there's no argument she's the best filly in the country, but I think the gap's closing. Greg, I thought Tiffany Rose was outstanding in third, and I thought the second horse, Amazing Dream, was good enough that as she drew the front line in the duels, and Sweet On Me drew the second line, she could beat her. So I don't think the duels is an open and shut case. It's about a dollar forty-eight, I think for Sweet On Me to win the jewels if she draws one, two or three. Yep, I think that'd be fair and everybody'd be happy to run that through their multis. But as we see the winning connections here, the Woodlands team and obviously the Kennys and, and Charlie Roberts own this horse and they are massive sponsors through Woodlands of racing at Alexandra Park and around the country, Greg. So no one's gonna begrudge them having an outstanding filly. But yeah, it's, it's not an open and shut case for mine, Greg the jewels because that gap's maybe closed by length over the last month I would have thought. Yeah they both earned over 100,000, 170 sweet on me and about 100,000 uh, for the runner up there. Barrier draw wise for the jewels we know there was news came out Michael this week that eight off the front at Addington Raceway so punters are going to need to take that into account uh, when it comes to working out once the, once the draws come out um, who is placed where. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. I think Barrier 9 at 1980, there'd be no point turning up and you just feel like scratching. I mean, I know Princess Tiffany was good enough to win from Barrier 8 last year, but not many horses can do that. So 11 New Zealand runners and one Australian invite. I think we're used to the Australian invites now, Greg. There's five of them in play. I think people are pretty realistic about the fact that it's part of the jewels heading forward. Lulu Le Mans and, and major occasion, there could be a slight issue with apparently, but we'll get to the bottom of that over the course of the next week. Pete's Big Jim has been poor this season so far. They've had some issues with him, Greg, but um, of course ran second in the duels last year and it's not a strong division this year. Falcon Stride and Majestic Player, who won at Menangle on Saturday night, Greg, they're the ones who are, are invited. Alpha Male will be invited, providing the connections get back to Harness Racing New Zealand by next Monday and say they're coming, Greg. If they don't, Confirm that by next Monday. All cashed up who races in the New South Wales Derby at Menangle on Saturday night is the likely backup plan because he's Majestic Player's stable mate and could come across with Majestic Player. Also, Greg, I believe Addington uh, has a really good idea. They're having an auction uh, on Trade Me, um, basically to say to people, look, we want to support St John's who did some amazing stuff at that horrific time on March the 15th in Christchurch, Greg, and they are going to auction a table for 10 uh, in the Silks and Satin Lounge. And Greg, I think it's awesome. I think it's great to see um, what's basically a $3,000 package going back to St. John's, who I think everybody in the country knows is part of the fabric of New Zealand and uh, does such a great job for everybody, but in particular Christchurch on March 15th. Yeah, and they have such a big part to play at all of our race meetings, Michael, so uh, good on Addington uh, coming up with that. All right, uh, we've got plenty more to come for you on the show, including a wrap of the two-year-old final out of Addington Raceway, uh, won by Samantha Otley and one change. And, of course, stick with us. You'll learn a little bit more about blood spinning.
Decent night Addington Raceway last Friday night it was as well, highlighted by the uh, two year old final, the $175,000 PGG rights and yearling sales open. Let's get Mark Mack to bring them home. Hot favourite in front, smooth deal, but it's stable mate, got the measure here in one change. Smooth deal is the leader, 150 to run. Half a length on flying, even better. One change is letting down. Smooth deal leads. Margin and neck on one change and flying even better. Smooth deal ahead, nose post comes. Not sure. Smooth deal, one change might have done it again. Sam, you've had a couple of days to reflect on what was a fine night for you at Addington. Yeah, for sure, Greg. Um, you know, you don't imagine, you know, having nights like that at the races, and you know, you sort of dream of them. And um, to pull off a big one, and you know, get two other on the night was, um, yeah, huge thrill. Let's talk about the Sale Series final and one changes performance. Um, it was imperative you got off the fence, and early on, that was probably the winning of the race. Yeah, like I had a, um, a talk to Nat after the race, and you know, she said that was the winning of the race. And um, when you look back on it, you know, to get in that good spot um, early, it probably was. You know, I, I um, when the draw came out, you know, I drew to the second low, and I was I was, I was happy with that draw. And then with the scratching of um, William Wallace, I thought, oh no, you know, changes things up a lot. So yeah, to get off early and, and get the run we did, it um, you know, it all come down to the end of it really. All right, you had a fair horse to chase down. Smooth Deal's been the benchmark all season as the two-year-olds. Were you confident you could pick him up? Yeah, um, like you say, he has been the benchmark and he's a very, very nice horse. And, you know, when he got the lead early, uh, you know, it was never going to be easy. But um, with the trip we got, I, I knew I had, you know, a lot of horsepower under me from his two runs he's had. He, he's very, very quick. Um, you know, straightening up, Tim kicked a little bit and, you know, we had a little bit of work to do. But um, to, the, to the horse's credit, he, he certainly knows where the line is, that's for sure. Congratulations to you. I know it was a big buzz on the night and to win one for the All-Stars, um, that all bodes well for the future, so nice work. Yeah, thanks Thanks very much to um, the owners and Mark and Nat, and yeah, yeah, huge thrill like you say. He's got a deep pedigree, this horse, Michael. Uh, he's out of the same family of changeover and choking, so um, he's got it in the blood. Look, a lot of people looked at him at the sales last year, Greg, and were put off because he, he didn't look quite right. There was a few little minor confirmation things there but just goes to show you that if they can run they can run. Greg the most important way to look at this race and, and, and congratulations to Sam I'm absolutely thrilled for her she's an outstanding driving talent and she's getting on some nice horses from time to time this is what she does when she does get on them. The best way to look at this Greg is we all think Smooth Deal is the best two-year-old in the country going into this race. If Smooth Deal did what one change did, we'd be going, wow, what a horse he is. He's come from two and a half lengths off the speed and beaten him. Well, one change is the one who did that, Greg. He's the one who, who starred, so he was absolutely outstanding. He has to be the best two-year-old in the country on form, Greg. Whether he is on overall potential, I guess we'll find out. But massive, massive winning performance. But from my point of view, Greg, the most heartwarming part was Sam's involvement. Just on Smooth Deal, um, Tim Williams reported that he raced a little bit dare and they have had a blood done on him and he just wasn't 100% right, so he may well be able to bounce back off that. That was a very good race a rendition of uh, the PGG rights in the Yelling Sales Open. What about what we've got ahead for you? $25,000, Forbury Park, nine races, 5.18, the start time there Thursday. Addington, Group 1 action, Neverly R Phillies final, uh, over 40 runnings of this great race amongst a pretty good programme there, 11 races, 5.05, will kick things off uh, with the consolation of the Neverly R. Uh, the $25,000 Hara de Trotter, Northern Trotting Guineas is amongst the programme there at Alexandra Park, nine races there, Winton on Saturday, 11.15, 11 races there. And then on Sunday, we will be at the Farlap Raceway, 11.45. Let's get into the Neverly R Phillies final. And the market looks like this. Inside back row draw for her, Michael Princess Tiffany. She's still very short, $1.75, but I think Bella Montana. In fact, it's remarkable, this back row here, that all of the big names, if you like, away from Wainui Creek and Kendra are on the back row. Yeah, it is. It, it's, uh, it's really evened the race up. But, Greg, I think Princess Tiffany's still clearly the horse to beat. I mean, we know how good she is, but more importantly, she follows out Wainui Creek, who has good gate speed, as does Kendra, so there should be a pretty decent hole to punch into. I think they'll punch through, Greg. I think Natalie won't bother pulling back. Um, yeah, I can see her getting through and getting in front of the other key favoured rival. She's still the one to beat for mine, but 
Yeah, Greg, it makes it interesting, her being on the second line. Had she drawn the front line, it may have been a precision. How good or how close or how comparable Bella Montana is to her, and let's not forget Bella Montana's beaten her twice already, I guess we'll find out on Friday night. Yeah, we will. That was her at the trials, just to show you that she's well forward for this race, home in 56, and did it very comfortably there. The other one I wanted to show you was Have Time. Uh, look, she won her Neville ER heat at Cambridge, but this was her last week at Alexandra Park, and she showed a, a different string to her bow here, Michael. So often it's been gate speed, get the front and let them run down or be right on the speed. She came from off at this time. And was very tough too. It's hard to come wide at Alexandra Park. It was a very quick last mile for this race. Look, she's in it, Greg, and again, like a lot of these horses, draw the front line, you have her odds, but I'll be surprised, as good as Wainui Creek is, Greg, if it's not Bella Montana or Princess Tiffany winning, and I'll go for Princess Tiffany because I do think she should punch into a nice hole from the second line. Here's the two-year-old trot, Greg, the sales series trot, and I know you're pretty keen on ultimate stride, but often, Greg, this race can be a one or two horse race with others who are just going around to get the check for turning up. There's five or six really promising two-year-olds in this, maybe even more, some of the others I don't know that well. Good. Yeah, exactly. American Pride is beautifully bred at a Yankee doozy. First up for the All-Stars. Cracker Hill won its first start. A bolt from Brilliance was second to Cheeky Baby, who's in this, of course, and is unbeaten. $9 chance. And one Magic Kenny is a $4.60 chance. And uh, look, if he goes as well as he did in this race, the trotting stakes back on the 20th of April, Michael, um, yes, he got run down, and it was a, a beautiful piece of driving uh, from uh, Ben Hope on Muscle Mountain, but, gee, he was brave. He was very good. No doubts he can win this race. Ultimate stride might be the most talented of them, Greg, but he's very much a work in progress back in the draw this time. But I can't make a choice between those two. In fact, I'm willing to back them both, Greg, because American Pride, as good as he is, is going to be, need to be really good to win this uh, on debut. Yep, definitely. Uh, so Ultimate Stride, I've made him my bet of the week, by the way. Uh, there's some other good races on the night, none more so than this. A deep, deep race. Valoria is a $9 chance. King's Landing with a view towards. This is the Harrah D. Trotter's uh, aged classic. And Destiny Jones, who you mentioned, Michael, went massive in the Row Cup. It was super, and if King's Landing wasn't there, they've found the right race, but King's Landing, Greg, looks like he's in that bunch of four-year-olds, those really good four-year-olds, majestic man, Sunday's son, so Greg, uh, I think he'll be winning, to be completely honest, so King's Landing should win, but Destiny Jones, um, very brave last Friday at the park, it's quite a quick turnaround. Greg, I'm going for Tickle Me Pink in the Guineas at Alexandra Park, I'm going to her against a lot of muscle, only because I think she has less question marks over her and missing the derby could be a good thing and you're going for ultimate stride with Phil Williamson back in the South Island to put the final touches and polish on him. Yep, best draw that that horse has had so I'm uh, pretty keen on it. Uh, Australian action, uh, the Bulls back Michael, Chicago Bull, um, they'll be raving about him again, he didn't beat much but he won. Look. Massive comeback. The, the key story here, Greg, is he's actually back after a horrendous injury. This isn't winning at Gloucester Park. He adds real depth to the Inter-Dominion. All those horses have been talking about spank him and turn it up and the fixer and Tiger Tara. Greg, all these turn up at the New Zealand Cup into the Auckland Cup and the Inter-Dominions in between. We have one hell of a November and December coming up. He's at least as good as the rest of these horses we've been speaking about, Greg. And as I said, he adds real depth. I won't forget that Alexandra Park winning performance back in the spring because, Greg, that showed just how potent he could be during an Inter Dominion. And that was the last time we saw him, of course, back in October. Majestic player we've talked about coming uh, for uh, the Harness Jewels potentially. And uh, this week we've got the New South Wales Trotters Derby and the Bull Eye Trotters and Pacers Cup. So plenty of information or plenty of action there for you. Short break for us when we come back. It's time to have a look into this blood spinning story.
Welcome back into your box seat. Of course, brought to you in association with Woodland Stud, Standing Sweet Lou, amongst the other outstanding stallions. Uh, we have been out and about. Yeah, a whole lot of talk in the industry about blood spinning, so I thought I'd go and find out uh, what it is all about. And we've split it into two segments. This week, we'll hear from uh, a veterinarian and Bill Bishop, who's been around this game a long time, and uh, get his insight into what it is all about. And we'll also hear from the RIU, the head of of uh, Harness Racing and Nick Ergren to get their take on it. Bill Bishop, almost five decades as a vet. That <laughs> takes some doing, doesn't it? It does. Makes you sound like an old man, really. <laughs> Why I bring that up, Bill, is what we're about to talk about today, blood conditioning, isn't new, is it? No, no. It's been around for a long time, Greg. Um, I remember back in 1972 when I started in practice, we'd see uh, ponies with laminitis and one of the sort of bush treatments as it were was to um, take a 20 mil sample of blood off them and then inject it back into them intramuscularly and sometimes you'd get quite dramatic improvement and, and results. We didn't really know why but that's really a similar process to what we're talking about these days. So tell me exactly what is blood conditioning? Well, basically, it's, it, it comes under the guise of a lot of different names, but it's basically variations on a theme. And the theme is, one, you collect blood off the horse, and it may be up to about 450 mils or so, just like a, giving a blood transfusion. Then you take that blood and you process it in such a way that you retrieve natural compounds that are in the blood that the horse has already made. They're, they're made by the horse. And then... What you do then is you harvest those that those products in a form, little say five mil lots, that you can then inject back or place back in the horse when the horse needs it. And I think the important thing when you when you hear that word processing, alarm bells go up and you think, wow, what are they doing to this blood? But you're not doing anything. There's no chemicals added. There's nothing. Nothing goes on except just harvesting that blood that, that the products that are in the blood already from the horse yeah the autologous part yeah. of it means autologous, autologous just means, whichever way you want yeah, to say it yep. it just really means just of the horse yeah yeah yep. so you can't actually and we'll talk about that later you can't actually give product from one horse to another yep. so how can the use of blood conditioning help a horse then well the best way we can to do it is when a horse has got a problem it gives us an opportunity to help the horse resolve that problem by reinforcing its own defences with product that we've taken off, off the horse itself, specific to that horse. And, and probably a really good example is perhaps a horse with an inflamed joint. Um, the flat, the a joint might blow up a bit, it might have strained the joint, it's hot, it's painful, horse doesn't like it, it's not going to race well like that. We can give it some anti-inflammatories that, that'll help reduce that, that inflammation, but we can't race when we've given that under the rules of racing. So what we can do though, is in those compounds that I was talking about in the body, they have ability to inhibit inflammation. So if we can slow that inflammation, inflammatory process down, inject something into the joint that delays and, and stops that inflammation, then the joint can heal and then the horse can go and race and it can race drug free. Yeah. Can the use of blood conditioning help a fit, healthy horse go faster? No. It's an easy one. Yeah, it can't. You, a horse can only go. I mean, I often liken horses to kids at school. When you're six years old, and the teacher said, "Run across the playground," the fastest kid always wins, and the slowest one's never going to catch up. But it, so it can't make a horse go a healthy, fit horse with no problems go faster. But what it can do, it can enhance the performance of a horse that is not right. So if a horse, is, say, has an inflammatory condition of its lungs and it's only running at 95% of its ability, if we can treat that 5%, we can help the horse get back up to its ability, the level it could run. Is part of that, yeah. Bill, um, the bleeding, bleeding of horses as well? Yes, is that, is that, that where you're talking about Yes, there? yeah, that's, that's, that's a good one, a good example. In fact, we can talk about that. with the When we take the blood, we, could, we end up with a fluid sample and that can be injected into a joint it can be injected into the bloodstream and it can also be nebulised or inhaled into the horse. And a lot of horses have 
low-grade inflammatory disease, a bit like people that are perhaps a bit inclined to have asthma. And then when the conditions are bad, it's worse. So what we can do when a horse is like that, if we can deliver the, a concentrated form of the product that they've made themselves to help fight that, then you, you, it's really Johnny on the spot stuff. Yeah, it's really good. Okay, here's a question a few viewers have come in with. Mark McNamara was one of them actually. Can the blood from a champion horse be injected into other horses and improve them? Wow, that's a good question. Wouldn't it be great <laughs> if we could? If, in fact, if the answer was yes, there'd be a lineup. People would be standing on the Tasman Sea lining up for winks. Yeah. <laughs> no, no you, the, basically you can't. And the reason those little compounds that we're transfer, what they, where they were concentrating and injecting back into the horse, are specific little molecules that are made by the horse themselves. They're peculiar to that horse. And they're primarily, there's a lot of different components, but they're primarily made of proteins. And those proteins, if they're injected into an, another horse, are foreign to that horse. And then you can have an allergic reaction, an anaphylactic reaction, you can have, yeah, sort of, so really it's a it's one-on-one. -on -one. And go, that's going back to your autologous uh, question before. Bill, blood conditioning, it can't give the horse the ability to carry more oxygen because, as we'll see in the process, we take the red blood cells out. That's dead right, yeah. And, that, and I think basically, as you, most people, well, blood's made up of three components, two components, cells and fluid. And the, as you say, the red cells carry the oxygen, white cells are there to fight infection and, and conduct a response, and the fluid conducts all those chemicals, or not chemicals, all those materials that the body's made to fight things. So it can't, it can't increase the oxygen carrying capacity, no. Can a horse return a positive swab using blood conditioning? It can, and that, that's, that's, that it can if the horse has got drugs in its system at the time of collection. And that's something you'd have to be, that's something that vet, as veterinary surgeons we're very aware of. So you, the, the scenario could possibly exist where you had a horse, say, that was spelling and you decided to take some blood off it and it had an anti-inflammatory in there. If you concentrated that and then stored it for three months and then decided to give it to the horse, that anti-inflammatory would still be in the blood and it would return a positive test. It'd be no different than if you had it gone out and injected an anti-inflammatory a couple of days before it raced. Yep. So that's something you have to be very careful that the horse is drug-free before we do these collections. Yep. We also now know that the blood collected and proceeds, it doesn't need to be used straight away, does it? No, that's the, that's the, beauty, of it. That's the beauty of it. And so what happens, a, a common example would be, going back to those joint problems, if you had a horse with a joint problem and we collect the blood and we might use three injections into the joint and then everything settles down, we can store that and, and just by freezing it and it keeps in, in the freezer is for a long time and then if the horse shows a wee bit of a flare there or just a thing, we can actually say, right, we don't have to collect another lot, we just get some more and inject it in. Yep. Tell me about blood conditioning, um, autologous condition serum that we're talking about here. Yep. Is it acceptable under the rules of racing? It is, it's acceptable. It's, it's under the rules of racing, there is, it's acceptable in Australia, New Zealand, and it's accepted by WADA, which is the the World Anti-Doping Authority. So they ratify this internationally, this, this is accepted. The only thing that you've got to remember though, in New Zealand, to safeguard inadvertent administration of drugs, that it can only be administered, there's a, the one free day of racing. So if a horse, say, for example, is racing on Saturday, no treatments can be administered the day before on the Friday. So you can, there's no, problem with using blood conditioning products, but they, they, going back to that Saturday example, they could only be ejected at the very latest on the Thursday. Yep. Bill, in your experience, is blood conditioning, are you a fan of the process? I think, I, I certainly am. And I think that what is happening, and going back to that earlier example about the laminitis and the, and, and the ponies, now I think people are becoming really aware that both horses and humans, that we're becoming more conscious of the fact that you you heal yourself, and that we we rather than and the ideally, I mean, it's a fantastic um, example of using science. If we can actually 
get a horse to heal itself and so it can race drug free with no outside assistance, that's the ultimate. But um, often by using a combination of drugs to settle things down and then using top up with the horse's own mechanisms, you've got an ideal situation. So big thanks to Bill Bishop taking the time out. He's a retired vet now and he's been in the game for more oh, the best part of 50 years. So he knows a thing or two about it. And uh, I thought he gave us uh, a terrific insight there in layman's terms, so not too technical. Uh, next week, we'll have uh, Lindsay Corwell and uh, Lee Pilcher will take us through the process so you'll be able to see exactly what it's all about. But we need to hear from the RIU. Uh, they have been right through the lab and checked it all out, and here's what Nick Ergren had to say about that. Autologous Condition Serum, uh, Nick. Whilst it sounds complicated, it's, it's not really, is it? No, it's not, and um, it's, it's very, very similar in nature to uh, other approved procedures such as PRP and IRAP, which have been around and, and approved for a, for a long time now. It's not closely aligned to blood doping, as quite a few people out there in the marketplace, the harness racing family, I suppose, for want of a better term, um, have been talking about. That's not true at all. No, uh, bl uh, blood doping's about increasing the concentration of red blood cells, and a as you'll see, the the process here involves actually discarding the red blood cells, so to, to call it blood doping is, is not correct. And clearly you guys have well and truly looked into this. Yeah, we, uh, we spoke with um, the lab in its early days of conception and, and while it was being set up we've, we've examined the lab with our chief veterinary advisor and, and he's, you know, his advice to us is that it complies with the rules and, uh, and is actually a, a really useful process for horses who may be suffering from um, arthritis symptoms and, uh, and, and perhaps it, it could also help with bleeders so if, if that's what it can provide then um, that's what it is. Yeah and the longevity of horses racing and, and, and the comfort for them I suppose is, is pretty imperative isn't it? Yeah exactly and, and our, our advice is that it may be able to elongate the careers of those horses with some minor injuries so um, it is rule compliant, there's no doubt about that, and it's always being closely monitored, this type of thing, by you guys, so the industry should have confidence in it, shouldn't they? Yeah, I think so. As, as with all our procedures and rules, Greg, they are constantly under review, and at this stage, our advice is uh, they, they firmly do comply with the rules and regulations, so uh, we're relaxed about it. So that was uh, Nick Ergren there, and we really needed to hear from the RIU. Uh, Michael, it ended up being such a big story, I thought if we rolled it all into one, it would just become a little bit elongated. So next week, the process, which is really interesting, uh, we'll have on the show. But um, there's the latest uh, on blood spinning. Great to get the update, Greg, because people talk about it like it's some thing which is naughty and shouldn't be going on and people are doing the wrong thing. As you've heard there, there's absolutely no issues with it. There's no way blood can be taken from one horse and put into another horse, so it's far less uh, well, far less harmful than I thought it was, Greg, to the industry, not to the horses, of course. So, yeah, interesting insight there. Looking forward to seeing how the process actually goes and whether, Greg, it inspires anybody else to try and use it and what it costs and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, that's next week on The Box Seat, the second half of your blood spinning story but well done mate it's uh, some nice investigative journalism we're going to take a short break on your box seat when we come back that other bloke's got some lawns to mow well welcome to the new segment on the show which is called losing Yep, we had a punting competition over the 10 weeks and me with my big mouth, I said if I lost to our two guest selectors, either of them, I would mow their lawns. Well, this man was actually the winner, uh, Mark Summit. Chase Summit, with, uh, congratulations, first of all, mate. Um, mate, obviously, we've been mates for years, played for the same rugby club. That's not how you ended up in the punting competition. And I'll be honest, it was a little bit of a fluke you got over the top of me. Oh, you might say that, but um, Stephen Reed's a good mate of mine, and he'd been giving me a little bit of information. Everyone's pretty keen to see you get beat, Mick. Yeah, I can imagine. And so it was only a matter of time. It happened to be the last week, really. But however, you've got to take the win. Here's the lawn. Um, let's talk me through this. It, it looks relatively unmanicured at this stage, so it's it's not big, but it's got a bit of work there to be done. Yeah, this was a lawn that was laid by um, your mate Ant Strawn's brother, actually, uh, Cam. Well, my, sorry, his um, nephew, and uh, he laid it for me, told me to keep it pretty long, and we've done that. It's about, 
eight, nine months old now. I like it. It's my lawn, and I tend to keep a bit of an eye on it. So, uh, and, yeah. And you've got a uniform for me. We'll get to the uniform in a sec. Um, you own horses. You've owned horses with, the, I think it's the Three Putt Syndicate for a while. You had a horse who was in the derby up in the north this year, a Mr Yips. Harness racing's changed a lot since you got involved, and you've, you've got a worthy opinion on it. Just down the road at Alexandra Park, the stakes are a lot higher. Is that something that would keep you and the boys in the game? They want to stay in the game, and I'm a bit of a junkie like yourself. I love being there and love having a bit of fun with it. And, yeah, the stakes are getting better, and so there's more incentive to be involved. Uh, you know, we were out there in the in the late 70s, early 80s with the likes of Stephen Reid and Derek Ball and those sort of guys. We used to have great fun out there, and, and th those fellas are still there. Is there a new bunch coming through, Mick? I don't know. Well, you're a businessman. You own your own business, and you're a multiple winner of the Australasian Auctioneer of the Year. From all that business acumen, if you could change anything you see in racing in New Zealand, what would it be? Um, well, getting into the ownership side of things, I think this has uh, proven to me what our real weakness is, and that's our communication. We're so poor at it. And I've had horses with a lot of trainers over the years, but compared with what we're getting out of Australia particularly, and dare I say it, some people in New Zealand, I'm hearing great things from a guy like Steve Telfer on communication things. I think the owners, they're excited. They just want to know all the time what's happening to their horses. And I think we're let down a little bit on that side of things. That would be a big move for me if everyone developed their ability to communicate all sorts of information back to their owners. Well, you've been communicating with one of the better communicators and Stephen Reid because he trained Puma Road to win the race that you beat me on. And, and well done to Linda Van Beek, by the way. She beat me as well, but um, Mark beat me by more, so I'm at his place. You've got me a lawn mowing uniform and then the embarrassing part's going to come because I have to try and start your lawn mower on television. So uh, what have you come up with for me? I knew this was something was going to happen here. Boys, Grego, be happy you're not part of this. Here we go. I'll get you to hold this, Sammy. I think Zach Butch uh, had that on that night, Mick, at uh, 12 to 1. Yeah, I think, I think these are, hmm, well, fair to say, not my best colour, but we'll do our best. This is my lawn mowing uniform. This is what happens, box seat viewers, when you've got a big mouth and you talk too much and you can't back it up in the picking competition. But let's be honest, it was deserved because it was the worst picking competition of all time. <laughs> Okay, this could be really embarrassing. Let's hope this goes well. So far, so good. the box seat after the duel, you can join us, and it'll be Greg O'Connor mowing the lawn to pick the roof. too much which is something you know all about so hopefully you can join us on the uh, next box seat punning competition and I'll keep these colours Man. for party nights. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Well Michael you delivered, you said you'd mow his lawns and uh, great to get that inside from Summy too because uh, he thinks a lot about this game doesn't he? He does and uh, look, the bottom line is Greg when you've got a big mouth and you say you're going to do things you've got to follow through on your bet so agreed Sammy has owned horses for a long time interesting comments here around communication from trainers uh, I think it's getting better Greg but it probably needs to and let's talk about Woodlands this week Greg they've um, continually rolling out these good horses who have big winning chances on Friday nights. Yeah, let's have a look at uh, the Woodlands runners for the week before we touch on a couple of other points uh, in the game. Double or nothing races in race number three. Bella Montana, of course, goes round in the Neville Yard and Flying Mr Ideal was in that trial behind Princess Tiffany. Takes his place in race number 11. Michael, you can wrap up the sales, which was, of course, uh, conducted on Monday and some big news on a former pacing star here. 
Your sales were good, the all age sale on Monday, the uh, average was up to about 10,600, so it was up quite, quite a bit, that average there. Um, we'll probably embellish the clearance rate up to about 96%. So yeah, Lazarus um, has been secured by Club Menangle, Greg. I like this idea. I I've seen the numbers. I think they add up. Um, Club Menangle have bought the Southern Hemisphere breeding rights for Lazarus. He'll stand at Yerubi Park Stud at Wagga Wagga in New South Wales. Greg, he'll still be available to us here. And of course, they'll pay up for the stallion nomination for the sire stake. So if you breed to Lazarus here next season, Greg, for 10,000 plus GST New Zealand, which be the cheapest price in the world, you'll still get exactly the same ability and opportunities for the stock as you would if you were standing here. But Greg, Club and Angle were bought into the horse, the Southern Hemisphere breeding rights. They said, we believe in the horse, and more importantly, it's going to help the New South Wales breeding industry. I think it's a very smart move, Greg. It's going to be great to see the champ return down under around about August. Thanks for your input, Michael. That's been your box seat for the week. We will both see you in seven days' time.